Hello everybody and welcome to Life Questions. I am your host, Bill Harris. We are here today with a round of questions and answers about life. The questions come from our viewers, you our faithful viewers, and the answers are coming from local ministers who have researched and reviewed your questions for answers with a biblical perspective. I want you to meet our guests right now. We have joining us today, Pastor Jason Goss of Wapak Church, Pastor Brad Taylor of the Lima Community Church, followed by Pastor Darwin Hartman of the Pike Mennonite Church. Rounding off our panel today is Pastor Neil Whitney of the Church at Allentown. Gentlemen, we're happy to have you all with us today. Thank you, good to be here. Yep. Okay, as we get right into these questions, I'm sure our audience is uh, sitting uh, on the edge of their seats waiting for all your answers. No pressure here now, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, this question, is, the question uh, says, as a divorced person, born again Christian of nearly 20 years, uh, am I forbidden to ever remarry? Does God still see me as married till death of either one of us as I vowed? If I did remarry, would I be causing another to commit adultery? When I study the word on this subject, that's been my understanding. Now, how do we, how do we take this case here, gentlemen, and what advice would you have to give? Well, before we start, we have to say what Jesus said. <laughs> I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. That's what it says. There you go. Yeah. Discussion over. <laughs> okay. right. But Jesus also said God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Okay. Yeah. So there's more to the Bible than that verse. All right. All right. <laughs> Now, how do we take that that, that you read about that, um, adultery and put that in the context of what this question is saying? How do you, I think your question speaks to it directly. I, I do. I'm not saying anything different. I think we need to understand why this was so serious. Because for, for God, marriage is a covenant. Mm -hmm. It's a vow that is, is meant to be an eternal vow. And, and when you understand there's a picture here, because just like uh, a man and a woman are married, the church is the bride of Christ. Correct. And how would you feel if every time we made a mistake that God said, giving up on you, walking away, <laughs> that's it, I'm done. And so for God, this is a very serious idea that I'm making a covenant that you are supposed to stay together. So we do know there are there some grounds for divorce, we, um, abuse, uh, adultery, a spouse who walks away and will not reconcile. Um, Reconciliation is always the goal. There's always a goal of, I want to make it work. It's not just a way out. Um, and so if you've been divorced, then the goal is, hey, can you honor God without being married? <coughs> Paul talks about in that in Corinthians. It's, it's better to be single because you can focus your energy on God. Then he also says, hey, listen, if there's a problem, if you can't, if, if your lust, your desires, then it's better to get married to bird. Now he's speaking about unmarried people and widows, but mm -hmm. I think it also applies to the person who's been, been divorced. So it's, the idea is I want to reconcile. The idea is I want to fix it. But if, I've, if I can't, then I can't, I can, there's nothing I can do. Okay. Anybody else want to add to that? <clears throat> I guess not. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I can add to that. Go right ahead. He, the question he says he's been divorced 20 years. I was divorced 43 years ago, <clears throat> actually more than that probably, and <coughs> I'm convinced beyond shadow of a doubt based on 43 years of experience that, that I'm married to the person that I'm supposed to be married to. No question in my mind, it's God's will. I know you're not supposed to judge anybody, but it's okay to be a fruit inspector. <laughs> and if somebody would look at the fruit of our marriage, they would surely say that God was not wrong in putting us together. So I really have to look at experience and what I've seen God done, what I've seen God do through people who have been remarried. We're supposed to grow the kingdom 
And if you want to take one scripture out of the Bible and use that to call somebody a sinner when they've asked God to forgive them and have repented of their sin and they went on to serve God, then if you want to stand on that, you can stand on that. But I'm going to stand on spiritual growth and faithfulness and fruitfulness. All right. Any further comments on that? Well, I might, pastor. might add some. I might have to talk randomly here just a little bit because I'm not sure where I'm going to go with this. But, <laughs> um, you know, God, God has an attitude about divorce. Mm -hmm. He hates it, it mm -hmm. says. Yes, he does. So it's not like he's going out uh, saying, well, it's just okay. On the other hand, um, divorce, uh, in, perhaps as it's viewed here, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the question is um, about adultery. Adultery can be committed in more than one way. Uh, spiritual adultery is a reality. Which, which one? Spiritual, spiritual adultery, adultery uh -huh. is a reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it's helpful to realize that the vows that were made were made and they're not intended to be broken, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 31, I think it is. Uh, so he intends for them to be kept. But he says, because of the hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce. And then Jesus gives this condition here. And the reference that uh, was uh, given from 1 Corinthians uh, about Paul's teaching on it. It seems to me like there's some breadth of understanding here that we need to be pretty generous with people in this. Uh, and I would say uh, it, it is of some concern to me on this one. It says this has been my, my understanding as I've studied this. Mm -hmm. I would go cautiously if that's his conscience. Romans 14, 23 says if it's, if it's not of faith, it's sin. So we need to be careful there, I think, also. And perhaps by reading and study his conscience, it can be malleable. And according to the scriptures, you don't want to go beyond that, you know. Um, Jiminy Cricket says, let your conscience be your guide. I guess that's good if, you're, <laughs> if you've got, got a, a biblical conscience. Uh, so, but yeah, that'd be my thing. I would, I would be cautious there, but I wouldn't be afraid of, sh I, I sure wouldn't shy away from, being open to understanding if there's maybe mm -hmm. truth to be. And by the way, I got confirmation from our producer that this is a woman that wrote this question. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I, it's just the, the, you have to go back to the idea, that idea that God takes marriage seriously. And there is a, it, it's that covenant. Like when God makes a covenant with someone, God doesn't break his covenants. Yeah. Right. And so he says, listen, when you make a covenant with somebody else, Take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Don't just, and I think, you know, don't just, well, I'm, I'm giving up. I'm quitting. Um, I got the advice when, when I got married. Listen, if you want to have a good marriage, don't ever mention the D word, divorce. Keep it out of your, it's not even an option. And you know what? That's been hard sometimes because there's some things you got to work through. It's a, that means you got to have conversations that aren't very fun. But you know what? You can make it if you have. So, hey, if, if it's happened and you've had a divorce, Okay. But let's move forward. You've asked for forgiveness. God forgives. We can move forward. One, one of the reasons God hates divorce is because it hurts children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and and everybody I can attest to that. You know, personally, there's yeah. consequences. There's horrible consequences of divorce. And the first one is children. So anytime I get in a situation now with people, children are the number one priority. Mm -hmm. Because I know how bad my children were hurt sometimes still till this day. So divorce has horrible consequences. Yeah. Yeah. I know I was hurt when my mom and dad uh, divorced. I was 15 at the time. I think even beyond that, it, it hurts everybody in the family that's uh, involved, you know, the parents, um, in-laws and the like, it, it, it hurts everybody. God, what's amazing, God hates divorce, but he continues to love the divorcee. Yeah. You know, and sometimes that gets lost in the process. You know, there's another <clears throat> thing that could be said that might be helpful for this woman. Um, what were the conditions of the divorce? That matters when, when remarriage is in yes. view. Yes, yes. So what were the conditions, and uh, where was she at spiritually at that mm -hmm. time? And mm -hmm. uh, so that, that would be important to know. Yeah, because <clears throat> for one, one thing that comes to mind immediately, what if there was an abusive situation there? And the woman had to uh, 
to flee because of her own life, her own safety, mm -hmm. that kind of situation. Uh, what if there was an extramarital affair on the part of the husband and um, she discovered that? And uh, I guess at that point would have the choice to decide whether to stay, as you talked about, and talking things through or felt it better to leave. So You just can't throw a blanket on it and say that no. was yeah. wrong. No, right. yeah. can't, right. can't do it. Can't do it. Yeah. All right. Um, let me just ask this question here. Um, question uh, that asks, my children were baptized as infants. Should they be baptized again now? that they are older. How about me? I was sprinkled for baptism. Uh, do I need to be immersed? So there's a few questions there. What, what do you have to say? So this you? is going to probably be different based on the denomination of the church you go to. I mean, everybody's kind of got, but isn't, what isn't we would case? say yeah. is we don't sprinkle infants, but we would call that a dedication. Um, Hannah brings Samuel. Mary brings Jesus into the temple for dedication. Mm -hmm. So we would dedicate, uh, we simply pray over the family that God gives them wisdom, thank them for the, the gift that God gave them. Children are a gift from God. Mm -hmm. And then we would say water baptism is a choice that every follower must make. Jesus was baptized. He commands his disciples to be baptized. He commands his disciples, go out and baptize. Mm -hmm. And so um, you can accept Christ in your life at any moment, at any time. No one has to even know. I mean, you could do it in your closet, in your room. You could do it. No one. Else. Water baptism is simply a declaration saying, I'm now changed. I'm putting my desires, my selfishness, my ways to rest, and I'm going to live for Christ. And I'm letting everybody else know this is what I'm doing. That's our <clears throat> stance. It's interesting. That, that is generally our stance as well in the Church of the Nazarene. Um, I think that there um, maybe maybe another way of viewing it or another very, I think, reasonable way of viewing it is that um, baptism is uh, in some ways biblically, is a, it seems to be associated with a welcoming to the family, sort of an okay. initiation to the community, right? Um, I think about just in the book of Acts, the many times that um, believe and we're baptized, believe and we're baptized. These words go together. Mm -hmm. And um, there is something, while I agree with you about the dedication, this yeah. is what we practice in the Church of the Nazarene as well. Uh, although the Nazarene Church does allow for infant baptism, we generally practice dedication. Um, there is something that is beautiful to me about about welcoming a newborn or an infant into the church community, mm -hmm. sort of in that way. Again, understanding that um, baptism biblically, I think, I think we have good grounds for understanding baptism bi biblically as a choice that's being made by a believer, right. by a person who's made a decision for Jesus. But, um, uh, you know, there's, there is something that is, I think, beautifully symbolic about what we do when we, when we baptize those infants, sometimes the same thing we're doing when we dedicate them, yeah. which is ultimately saying to the parents, to the family, uh, it's your desire that this little one would be raised in, uh, in a Christian way, in a godly way, you know. All right. You know, were you going to add to that? Well, I, I might, uh, just a little, I mean, uh, I mean the, the Mennonite, Mennonite church that I come from, uh, historically, uh, 500 over years ago, this was the issue. This was the crux of the yeah. issue, yeah. Uh, was baptism. And um, there were many that died for believers' baptism. This was the point. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, um, I, I, would, I would agree on, uh, I, I think, on the, the baptism is for believers. Um, I, I went to seminary. I went to, uh, of course, was a different kind of seminary mm -hmm. than than uh, my denomination and uh, infant baptism uh, was very much a practice there. And I understand the covenantal understanding of that, which is kind of, uh, it's, it's a nice understanding, I like it. Um, I, I disagree with it, but, but just the same. I would say this though to a different question here. Um, he, he brings up sprinkling for baptism. That's a mode. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a biblical picture of a sprinkle. Uh, you know, Moses in, in maybe Exodus, 24-ish, somewhere in there. Uh, he, he, uh, he read the law to the people, and they said, yes, we do, and he sprinkled them with blood. It was a, a picture of baptism, in a sense. And, and then, um, in, so I, don't, I wouldn't be too hung up on the, on the mode so much, uh, although I think, I think probably baptizo means immersion, uh, you know. <laughs> <Right>. um, <clears throat> so. 
Yeah. 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 Very good. Okay. Well, listen, we we're, we're we're due for a break at this point. We're going to come back and have more discussion. So don't go away. We will be right back. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastures you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pasture suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. Thank you for staying with us. Another viewer question. I was 100% Catholic for 58 years and I knew nothing else and most, of, uh, most any Christian inklings are thwarted quickly. That being said, my heart grieves for my daughters and most of my friends that follow all the rituals and rules and believe things just not biblical. Um, not really a question there, but can you, can you get anything out of that in terms of where that viewer might need help? Wanting to know if there are things that do not have a biblical basis or some sort of a Christian foundation, why should they be practiced, I guess? Well, that begs the question, if I was born and raised as a cannibal, would I think it was okay to kill and eat people? So mm -hmm. that's a nature and nurture question, mm -hmm. which grows into a spiritual question as time goes on. Mm -hmm. My heart has his heart goes out to anybody who has been taught something that they believe at the bottom of their heart that it's true. And sometimes maybe it might not be like for the cannibal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a challenging question. Yeah, and this is a, <clears throat> pardon me, this is a former Catholic, by the way, that's, that's writing this. That there's a challenge that really no matter uh, what church you go to, that if you focus too much on the rules mm -hmm. and you forget about that relationship, right. um, there's a danger there. Sure. I, I actually had a, a former Catholic who started to enter a church and she told me her story a little bit and she was for, forbidden to read the Bible because her parents thought that that would mean she had to become a nun. Hmm. Really? Yeah. And so, I mean, there's this, this kind of thing you have to kind of balance is, listen, there are, the rules are there for a reason, so that I honor God, but I can't just take those and forget about the relationship. And I can't just take the relationship and go, well, I'm not going to follow you in the rules. There's a balance between the two. Yeah, I think, well put. Uh, Neil, earlier you, in the, in the question, where we dealt with divorce, you said we can't throw a blanket over over yeah. it. And I think that just applies here too. You know, there's, we, we don't want to paint with too broad of a brush. Mm -hmm. um, I think that probably like all of you, I know uh, a number of people who are of the Protestant persuasion who don't really have a very authentic relationship with Jesus. And I know a number of people who are of the Catholic persuasion who do. And, um, I, you know, I think a lot of times those, some of those rituals and the, the rites, the sacraments really are, um, they're means of grace. You know, this is, here's the, my Wesleyanism coming out a little bit, but these are, these are means of grace. They're opportunities for us to interact with the divine. And um, I think that, you know, certainly that can become rote. It can become a little too routine, but it doesn't have to. And, you know, I think we ought to be careful to make sure we don't paint with too broad a brush. Okay. If, his, if his or her heart grieves for their children, then he should go to, he or she should go to their children with their heart mm -hmm. and talk to them. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, another question also from this same former Catholic uh, viewer. My main heartache is purgatory, hmm. which to me is sending multitudes to hell daily. Why stop sinning when you can burn off sin for the next 100,000 years by having people pray you into heaven? Please share your thoughts on this, as well as tips to pray for Catholic loved ones who are still focused on purgatory as a possibility. Well, I've got a couple passages of scripture and then I've got some history. All right. right. Okay. All right. So Hebrews chapter 9, 26. And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment. Mm 
Okay. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. We know that one. Mm -hmm. Romans 6, 7, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. So the idea that purgatory exists, this is our belief, our standpoint, that, that it, there is no such thing. Purgatory is not mentioned in Scripture. Death is the full, complete punishment for sin. Mm -hmm. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, 5 says, The living at least know they, they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, nor are they remembered. So, the ancient Greeks, it was a pagan belief. They believed in purgatory that it was a limbo between the afterlife. And uh, Clement of Alexandria, about 15, uh, 150 to 250, uh, I'm sorry, 150 to 215 AD, was influenced by this philosophy and inserted the dead can be cleansed of sin. Okay, he was a uh, um, Catholic uh, uh, priest. Mm -hmm. Pope Gregory the Great stressed the fire of purgatory as a matter of unquestioned belief, and that was he was the Pope from nine, uh, 590 to 604, and he's usually called the inventor of purgatory. The Catholic Church then redefined its official teaching in the Council of Lyons in 1274, uh, Florence 1439. And so it's become more of a tradition mm -hmm. than it really has roots in Scripture. And so really uh, it became a way along with other practices that the Roman Church put into in that time to kind of collect offerings. It was a, it was a money maker. Oh. And so that's really where the tradition goes to. Because, hey, if, if you pay for your aunt... Give me a hundred bucks and I'll pay for it. So this is one of those things that, that, so how do we deal with it? Well, I have to understand that biblically, where do I go and how do I talk about it? And it's, it's a tough conversation, but if, if upon death, that's judgment, according to the scriptures we read, there, there mm -hmm. is no more, then that's where I have to stand. And that's, um, then what's the point? If there is purgatory, mm -hmm. then what does it matter what I do now? I'll just, I'll just let my, my future, you know, kids or whatever, I'll let them pray for me. That that doesn't bode well with anything Scripture says. So, Jason, that that is the very point that I want to focus on, and that you know, in the question, the the second part of the question says, "Why stop sinning yep. when I could continue to sin mm -hmm. and have somebody else, you know, pray for me?" Mm -hmm. And I, instead of focusing on the purgatory piece, which that's a fine question. Let's talk about why inherent in the question is the idea that continuing to sin in this life is good or is, I think that it's, the idea is that it's fun. Yeah. And you know, it's just, it's such not a biblical idea. It's, it's so clear that when Jesus talks about the abundant life, that it's, he's not talking about a life that starts in eternity. He's talking about a life that starts now, that he brings us an abundant life now. And um, it, we think about the consequences of sin and the ramifications of, of living a life that, you know, it, it, continuing to sin. Um, and I think I would just challenge the notion that that is good in some way, that, that you know, there's a, I think there's a really strong biblical foundation that we ought to be pointing people away from sin and to, and toward holiness. Paul, Paul talks about you know. that, you know, hey, should I just keep on sinning? Because right, God gives right. grace and Yeah, mercy. by no means, no. he says. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yep. Well, it seems, yes, like the, the fear here might be more the fear of hell or hell than the fear of God, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. we need to think about and bring into the equation. And um, another thing about uh, purgatory, I, we could talk about that a little bit, but I would rather talk about the gospel and the nature of the gospel. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 521, maybe it is, says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin, mm -hmm. yeah. so that I could become the righteousness of God mm -hmm. in him. Mm -hmm. There's no purging of me that needs further purging. Mm -hmm. After I've passed on and I've, I've entered into eternity, uh, the blood of Christ is all that purges us. Mm -hmm. It's not the prayers of the saints. And it's not my own purification through the fires of purgatory, yeah. but rather it's, it's the sacrifice that Jesus made. Mm -hmm. So I think it takes Jesus out of the place he rightfully belongs. Mm -hmm. So that would be my thoughts there. I went to a concert one time, and it was a youth-oriented concert at Ixus in Kentucky, and the speaker stood up and said, I just want you young people to know that, that once you become a Christian, you can drink all you want, you can smoke all you want, you can sin all you want. And I'm like, as a youth leader, I'm like, get that guy off the stage. <laughs> he said, but you need to understand that once you become a Christian, you won't want to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a condition of a heart, yes. bottom line. Yeah. 
Bottom line, exactly. Yeah. Let's move on to one last question here that we can uh, make some time for here. Um, and this is a question. Um, I have uh, become friends with a person who was hurt by the church in her teen years. As a result, she turned completely away from religion and faith. I want to witness to her, but I don't know the best way to start. I wish I knew what the hurt was. I mean, of course, that's a, that's a private matter, I understand, but in terms of trying to get our arms around this for some good answers to help people. Well, she, what, she needs what, hope in her life, so the wait, best way we, we to get... We have two minutes left, by the way. Go ahead. So ahead. She, needs, she needs hope in her life, so the formula for hope is love and care. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So if she loves her and cares for her, that will give her hope. Absolutely. Love and care. Yeah, she, she, has, she has faith of a kind. Um, it's not that she's given up faith per se. She's, her faith is that there isn't a God that she met in church, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would be, I, to me, I, I would reference uh, Matthew 11, 29, following... Jesus has come to me. Make the issue Jesus, not the church, not not the establishment or the institution. And would be my as opinion. the conversation goes on, then you can help her understand that. Listen, hurting people hurt people, yeah. and they're in the church. And so, when you're hurt by others, it just should recognize that other people are dealing with same issues and same stuff. And we go to church not because we're perfect. We go to church because we know who the answer is, the, yeah. who, who the hope yeah. is. The church is a hospital. Yeah, no, it's not. You know, it's not where the perfect people go. I think just to Neil's point. Um, the, the, if the question is, I want to witness to her, but I don't know the best way to start. The best way to start is by living the right Christian life, the yeah, loving yeah. Christian life, yeah. uh, and being, being faithful to that. You yeah. know, you can give her a different picture of the church that, you know, can change her, can change her perspective. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's really well said. I, let her see Jesus. Yeah. Let yeah. her see Jesus. That's, that's her right. thing. That's right. All right. Well, thank you very much. This is a very timely, and we certainly hope and pray that God does bless and heal that lady of her uh, situations there. Well, that's all the time we have for today. We want to thank you for tuning in, being with us, and I'd like to say to our panel of pastors, thank you very much for your wisdom that you've shared with us today, all coming out of the Word of God, and amen. Believe, believe me when I say that the Word of God is not like any other book. It is a live, a living, breathing document from God, and it's effective. Let it have its effect on you. God bless you. Until next week, when we meet again, I'm Bill Harris. Bye-bye for now. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com. <laughs>